Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today, we will start our study to the second book of Thessalonians. Last week, we covered 1 Thessalonians. If you missed any of uh, our teachings, always go to our website, kuim.org, or you can go to our YouTube or SoundCloud channel. It is Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Before we continue, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you because not only that your presence is always in us, but uh, it's always wherever we gather. Because your word says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. We pray that you would teach us by your word this morning. Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you will open the eyes, ears, and hearts of everyone listening, wherever they are listening from this morning. Minister to us simultaneously. You know what we need. We pray that you will give that to us. Give us revelation, knowledge, and understanding of the word of God. Not only that we get the revelation, but also give us the enablement to be doers of the word of God. Heavenly Father, as we live in a world that we are bombarded every day with all manner of uh, these distractions, as we live in a generation of people full of uh, short attention span, we pray that you will put your desire in our heart. Desire to study your word. Desire to abide in your word. That we will not be conformed to this word. Rather, we will be transformed by the renewal of our minds. So that we can prove that which is good, acceptable, and your perfect will for us. None of me, but all of you, be praised glorified and worshiped forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. My friends, welcome. Today, we will start the uh, second um, Thessalonians. Uh, let me give you a synopsis of it. Second Thessalonians was written by Paul, the apostle, about 51 and 52 AD. It is an eschatological epistle along with uh, First Thessalonians, in the sense that it talked about the rapture of the church, things that are yet to come, the time of tribulation, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you how Paul started this church. During his uh, second missionary journey with Silas, when they got to Dobi, Timothy joined them there. And when they wanted to go to Britannia and um, Asia, they were forbidden by the Spirit of God. So where they were at Troas, Paul had a vision. In that vision, he saw a man that said, come over to Macedonia and help us. They concluded that uh, the spirit of war, God was calling them to go into that area, so they went. The first city they visited was Philippi. In Philippi, they met with uh, 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 some women at the riverbank on a Sabbath day. One of them was Lydia, the purple seller. And uh, in Philippi, they got into so much trouble. Paul delivered a girl possessed with a spirit of... Uh, he was possessed with a, 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 a spirit of soothing. Uh, this spirit made him uh, uh, so much, made her so much uh, money for the owners, the spirit of divination. So when Paul dealt with this spirit, the owners, 
they were so mad at Paul because uh, this was the source of their income through suit telling, fortune telling. And uh, because as a result of this, Paul and Silas, they were beaten. They were taken to the magistrates and they were put in stocks, thrown into the prison. And the next day they had to leave town. They were ordered to leave town. The next place they went was uh, Thessalonica. In Thessalonica, Paul reasoned with uh, the Jews in the synagogue for three Sabbath days, which is about three weeks at most a month. And when they could not take his teaching anymore, they ran him out of town. So they went to Berea. Even in Berea, the same Judaizers ran him out of town again. So he went to Athens. And while he was at Athens, he was waiting for Silas and Timothy to join him. And when Silas and Timothy came from Berea to Athens, Paul sent uh, Timothy back to Thessalonica to go and strengthen these uh, new converts and to encourage them in the Lord. Well, he went down to Corinth with uh, Silas and uh, Luke. It was believed that Luke joined them at Philippi. Now, Timothy came back from Thessalonica to Corinth and gave Paul the, the, the progress notes about this church. They started. And it was a good one. Paul wrote the first letter to Thessalonians to answer the questions which Timothy had brought up, the concerns that they had about the message Paul gave to them within that three weeks they were there. So Paul wrote that letter and gave it to Timothy to go back to Thessalonica. And Timothy came back the second time now, telling Paul about the progress of the church and also the questions these people had. So Paul penned the second letter of Thessalonians and gave it to Timothy again to deliver to them. It is believed that uh, from the time Paul wrote the first letter and the second letter, about six months, less than a year at most. So this is the summary. We're going to go ahead now and start the study. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, Salvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, Paul joins uh, Silas and uh, Timothy in his greeting to the church. Why? Because Silas uh, already was with Paul at Corinth when he wrote the, where he wrote this letter. And Timothy was going back and forth at this time, delivering these letters to the saints at Thessalonica. And uh, Paul equals Jesus Christ here to God. He says, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This would be blaspheming if Jesus Christ is not equal to God for Paul to make this statement. There are so many people, even some who claim to be Christians, who deny the deity of Jesus Christ. To them, Jesus Christ is another oratorical entity. One who did some miracles, a prophet, a messenger of God. That's all he was, and that's all he is to them. But here, Paul is telling us that Jesus Christ and God, they are equal. Not only did Paul tell us this, but Jesus Christ himself said it. For he said, if you see me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father are one. The Bible tells us that he is the express image of God. Still, there are people who 
believe that he is not God. There are so many religions and they believe that um, they can have access to God, the Father, without Jesus Christ. And this is deception gone on rampage, unchecked. For you to have such a belief means that you are in deception. The Bible tells us that you cannot have the Father without Jesus. So both they go together. If you want to have the Father, then you must have Jesus. You cannot have your way to a heaven without Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So if you are in this situation, if you're one of those who believe this, it is a high time you begin, began to believe the truth. There is only one way to God. And that way is uh, through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Paul also greeted the saints with uh, grace and peace. Typical of uh, Pauline's greeting. You will see this in most of his epistles. Grace and peace. He will always have them in this order. And uh, for the simple reason that until you understand the grace of God, you will not have the peace of God. Now, you will have peace with God because that is already established through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When you got born again, <coughs> you had peace with God. But the peace of God can be lacking in you if you don't understand the grace of God. If you, under if you don't understand that it is by grace that you are saved through faith and not through works. If you don't understand that uh, we receive God's blessings and his love towards us is based on the sacrifice of Jesus, not by what we do. If you don't understand this, then every day you will try to do more and more in your physical effort to please God. And anytime you fall, you fall short of this, Anytime you miss the mark, you are so depressed and you are so scared that God is going to visit you with anger and punishment. So there is no peace in you. So he will always greet the people saying, grace and peace be multiplied in you. In verse 3 we read, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting because your faith grows exceedingly and the love of every one of you all abounds towards each other so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Paul thanked God for the progress that this church was making, spiritual progress as it were. Not only that he thanked God, but he was bragging about this church. <laughs> he was boasting about them to other churches. Wherever he went, he was boasting about this church, this spiritual progress they were making in the midst of trials and tribulations. Do you know that it is okay to boast <laughs> but you must boast in the lord you must boast in the power of the holy ghost <laughs> not on your own effort because that would be pride but it is good it's okay to boast about what god is doing by the power of his holy ghost and that's what paul is doing here so he thanked god for the progress this church was making in spite of tribulations and persecutions
Now, I want to leave you with this lesson. That tribulation has never hindered the progress of the church. No, it has never. Let me give you two examples. When communism came to China, uh, because it came with great persecution of the church, the church went on the ground. And uh, people thought that uh, this will extinguish church growth. But it was the opposite. As a result of the persecution, millions came to Christ, even up to this present day in China. The second example is during the early church. In Jerusalem, Christians were persecuted. As a result of that, they were scattered all over the place. But do you know that wherever they went, instead of them quenching the fire, they started new churches. What is this telling us Christians? It's telling us that uh, when you got born again, have it at the back of your mind. Have the consciousness. Let it be settled in you strongly. That's uh, your conversion. You receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior will come with the persecution package. It's unavoidable. It is part of it. So understand this. But the Bible tells us the manner, the attitude of the spirit to go about this persecution. Is it going to come? Yes, it will come. It is settled. But how are we supposed to deal with this, with the persecution when it comes? Jesus tells us. James tells us. Paul tells us. James says, count it all joy when you go through diverse trials. Knowing that the trial of your faith works patient. Let patient have her perfect work in you. That you may be complete, wanting nothing. He says, Persecution will cause you to be strengthened in your faith to the point that you will, you, you will grow wanting nothing. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5 verse 3, he says, But we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produces perseverance, and perseverance character, and the character hope. <laughs> so, in the times of tribulation, he says, the attitude of your heart got to be, I glory in this tribulation. This tribulation is going to produce character in me. It's going to strengthen my faith. God is in me. He will never leave me nor forsake me. By the power of the Holy Ghost, I am going to overcome this persecution. And I'm going to stand strong as a victor and also a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus says, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. He tells you the manner that you ought to take persecution. He says, be of good cheer, smile and be glad and count it. Count yourself worthy to suffer persecution. Rejoice. That's what apostles did when they were flogged and they were warned never again to speak in the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that they went to their own company. They were so happy that they were counted to suffer in the name of Jesus Christ. So this is persecution. Count it all joy. When it comes, do not give up. Know that you are going through it not only by yourself, but the Spirit of God is there always and He will cause you to always prevail. Baruch Hashem Adonai, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are in verse um, 5. Quit 
is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God. That you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you also suffer. Since it is a righteous thing with God to repair with tribulation those who trouble you. He says that um, tribulations, persecutions, he says they are evidence of God's righteous judgment. A difficult thing to understand. How can tribulation be an evidence of God's righteous judgment? To us, we see tribulation as injustice, as evil, as something that is not good against us. But Paul sees it here as an evidence of God's righteous judgment. How can he make such a statement? Yes, it is true. For the simple reason that God is going to turn the table on them that persecute you. He's going to turn the table on them that afflict you. And he will turn the persecution against them. Now, persecution is a proof that you are declared worthy of the kingdom of God. The verb there is declared worthy. It's not saying that persecution qualifies you to be worthy of the kingdom of God. No, that's not what he's saying. Remember, we are saved by faith. It is by the grace of God that you and I are saved. It is a free gift from God. We don't work for it. Tribulation does not produce salvation. What produces salvation is our faith in what Jesus Christ did for us. But which one comes first? Is it salvation or tribulation? Salvation comes first. Your tribulations and your persecutions start when you, after you got saved. So what qualifies you to be declared worthy of the kingdom of God is salvation. But tribulation is a proof that you are saved. Are you getting what I'm saying? So don't Go about saying because I'm going through tribulation, uh, I, I, I am counted worthy of the, of the uh, uh, kingdom of God because of that tribulation. No, it's just only a proof that you are saved. It is your salvation that counts you worthy of the kingdom of God. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 7, it says, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. He's talking about two things here now. So he's talking about the time when these two things will happen. The time when God will turn the table on them that persecute you. And uh, the time when you will take your rest from persecution. So he tells us what the time is going to be. It is the rapture of the church. When Jesus Christ will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, with a trump of God. When this uh, corruption will put on incorruption, when this mortal will put on immortality, when that which was sold in this glory, in this honor, shall put on glory. When that which was sold in weakness will put on power. He says, this is the time when this will happen. Because 
the moment the rapture happens, begins the seven-year tribulation. So what he does here, he gives up the time frame and uh, the two things that will happen at this point in time, which is the rapture of the church. In verse 8, he says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. He talked about uh, this. The 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 the, the do, to, he's talking about turning the table on those that afflict you. We talked about that in uh, verse five and six. Now he's going to tell you now about uh, the punishment that will unfold during this time of tribulation. He says that will be punishment. He tells you why there will be punishment and, this, and what this punishment is going to be. During the time of tribulation, which you and I, anyone who believes in Jesus Christ will not go through this tribulation. During the tribulation time, there will be wrath of God poured upon the earth. To the unbelievers, to the disobedient. For the simple reason, they rejected the sacrifice Jesus Christ made on their behalf. They said, no, we're not going to take it. Jesus Christ became the propitiation, not only for our own sins, but for the sins of the whole world. For it behooved the Father to bruise him. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our own iniquity. In Malachi chapter 7 verse 19, he talks about God will subdue your iniquities and he will cast your sins in the depth of the ocean if you would receive that which Jesus Christ did for you. All of us have gone astray in his own way. But God has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He became the mercy seat, the goel, the redeemer. And if anyone will refuse to take that punishment which he took for anyone who will believe, that one will have to take the punishment for themselves. This is the reason why people will go through tribulation. Because they refuse to receive by faith the punishment which Jesus took for them. And because God is just, he must punish sin. But the Bible tells us the soul that sins, it shall die. The wages of sin is death. All we have seen and fallen short of the glory of God. So God will punish. He will punish sin because he is just and righteous. Now when the seven vials we are poured out from heaven, we see this in Revelation. A voice from the altar in heaven says, True and righteous are your judgment. Oh God. So the voice says that the judgment of God is because he is righteous. He will punish sin. In Revelation chapter 6, if you read all the way to chapter 18, you will see the opening of seven seals. The sounding of seven trumpets. The pouring of seven vials. Upon the earth. When the anger of God will be unleashed to the disobedient one. If you go from 
opening up for seal one to seal four. The Bible tells us one quarter of the earth dies. That's a lot of people. Jesus tells us about a little bit about this. He says the tribulation will be so great that it has never been seen before up till that moment and will never again be seen. That's how great the tribulation and the great tribulation will be. But remember, this tribulation, like I said, is not for the believer. <laughs> you and I will not be there. It is reserved for the disobedient. <laughs> the ones who refuse the sacrifice of Jesus. The Bible tells us that uh, in Revelation, that the small and the great, we are standing in the presence of God. He says, the books were open, and then another book was open, and the people were judged based on the things which were written in that book. He tells us that the sea gave up the dead that were in them. He says, death and Haiti gave up the dead that were in them. He says, and if anyone was found whose name was not written in the Lamb's book of life, he says that one was cast into Gehenna. Jesus described Gehenna as an outer darkness where they will be born with fire and brimstone for eternity. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, a miserable place to be. A place of torture and a place that you don't have any presence of God in it. A dark place. And every day there are people who are headed in that direction. Going in that direction. Because broad is the way. Wide is the gate. That leads to this direction. Because of what people believe. Because of, the, because of their rights, they claim. Because they don't believe in the simple gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're headed in this direction. But uh, narrow is the gate. Narrow is the way. And straight is the gate that leads to eternal life. And Jesus says, just a few will find this route. So my question to you, it is not too late for you to miss this route and go this other route. As long as you are alive. For there is a way that seems right unto a man. But the ends thereof are ways of death, destruction. You don't want that, you don't want it to be too late for you. No. There is still time today to turn away from this direction and go the other direction, which is receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior with all your heart. The time is very short, good friends of mine. The moment is just around the corner. The rapture of the church is imminent. It can happen any time. You don't want to wait for it to happen before you change your course. No. It is only a fool who wants to do that. Who wants to tread? Who wants to rush in where the angels fear to tread? So, I wanted to talk about those who say all roads lead to God. Yeah, you may be right. You may be right. In the sense that uh, everyone someday will stand in the presence of God. We call it the white throne judgment. For anyone who is not born again. Anyone who's not a Christian will stand there, white throne judgment of God. So every road will lead you to that, to see God someday. But the question is this, 
Will every road lead you to heaven? Will every law, road lead you to salvation? And the answer is no. There is only one road that can lead you to salvation. There is only one road that can lead you to heaven. And that road is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are making progress. I believe that this is, this. we have only um, 12 verses in this um, uh, chapter 1. So that's not a lot to cover. I'm very sure we'll cover it on time. Uh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in uh, verse 10. He says, when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe. Because our testimony among you was believe. Here he's talking about the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let me give you the order again. The order is... Uh, the rapture of the church will happen first, which is imminent. After the rapture of the church, will those who, who miss the rapture, if I will put it that way, we are not born again at that point, will have to go through seven years tribulation. The first three years, three and a half years will be a little light. But um, the second half of that tribulation, Jesus said that um, if those days were not shortened, no flesh would be saved. But because of the elect, those days will be shortened. So the second half will be when the Antichrist will declare himself as the Messiah, he will cause the abomination of desolation. And that will be severe. Uh, 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 um, punishment coming from heaven, from God, and also from the Antichrist to those around at this point in time. And after the seven years of tribulation, Jesus Christ with his saints, that's what he's talking about here, the, the coming in glory of the Son with his saints. So we who were raptured with him will return with him now in glory. For in Jude, he tells us that the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints. And uh, when him who is our life shall appear, we will appear with him. So Jesus, we will arrive with Jesus Christ. And he's going to set his foot on Mount Olives. When he does, the Bible tells us that he's going to Split in two. And there will be a river that will go in between. Then he will establish his 1,000 years reign here on earth. And blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus. Bible says that we will rule and we're going to reign with him from Jerusalem. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just this alone is a thing of joy. If you're going through tribulation or, or through or trials and difficulties, regardless of what the situation is, the remembrance of this should be something that will invigorate your mind. Oh, something that will quicken your spirit. Something that will give you hope and joy and gladness. Oh, knowing that someday <laughs> from Jerusalem, you and I will be ruling with the Lamb, the Messiah, the one that was slain from the foundation of the earth. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we are in verse 11. It says, therefore, we also pray always for you that our God will count you worthy of this calling. And fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. 
that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul prays this prayer. And do you know that Jesus prayed a similar prayer? Yes. He said, watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all of these things that are coming and that you will be standing in the presence of the Son of Man. Jesus prayed the prayer. Paul prayed this prayer. But do you know that you also pray this prayer if you're a Christian and that it has already been answered? <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> you see, he says that you will be counted worthy to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. That you may be counted worthy of the calling. The day that you made Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, from your heart. The day you got born again was the day you prayed this prayer. And because you received the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you were recreated that day by the Spirit of God. You, become a, you became a new creature. So that has never existed before. And then you became the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That day you were counted worthy to stand in the presence of the Son of Man, which is Jesus Christ. Now the Bible tells us that it is true. Because Jesus Christ said, no one that will come to me will I cast by no wise cast away. He says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans chapter 10 verse 10, Nine, he says, if you will confess with your mouth, Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believe, whosoever believe, whosoever believe, should not perish. But we have everlasting life. But we will be counted worthy to stand in the presence of the Son of God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now, we let Christ be glorified in us by our own ways of life. The way we conduct our business. <laughs> the way we speak. The way we act. That Christ be magnified in us, whether we are alive or by death. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Good friends, we've come to the end of today's teaching. Wherever you are this morning, under the sound of my voice, you are not hearing me by accident. If you are not born again, if you not met Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior, today I will lead you in a prayer. That will change everything for you. That will bring you right into the kingdom of God. That will bring you into salvation. You see, friends, salvation is already made available. It's not something we pray and we fast and we cry to God and we shed tears. No. It's not something that we have to work hard and every day we must check how good we have become. No. It is a free gift. Jesus took the prize for us. Because he, 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 we, there is nothing you could do. To have earned salvation on your own effort. For all our righteousnesses are as filthy rocks in the presence of God. The Bible tells us. But there is a way out. Someone has made a way for us. Now to come in by faith. Oh, no longer shall we be judged by our own human efforts. But by what sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for every one of us. So he calls you today to come. Come, he says, it's free. Come, come, as you are. Don't prolong it any longer. Don't say, let me go. I, I, I need to straighten out a few things and then I will come back. No, you, you don't have such a time. The time is very short. 
When you hear the voice, the day you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Do not be like the children of Israel. In the desert, they tempted God. They were disobedient. They did not believe him. And because of that, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. A journey that they could have accomplished under two weeks took them 40 years. Because of unbelief. So he says, I'm standing at the door. Jesus is saying, he says, and I'm knocking the door of your heart. He says, when you hear the knock, he says, open so that I can come in and be one with you. You are the one who is responsible to make this commitment. No one else is going to do it for you. God created you and I as free mortal agents. We make our own choices and he will respect every choice that you make. He will not force you into salvation. The moment has come again. If you've been hearing this call for years and you've not submitted to it, today is the day to do so. Why? Because the time is very short. David is talking to Jonathan and says, there is only one step between me and death. You can change that statement as only one step between you and salvation today by receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. And all your sins will be washed away. You will become a new creature. Now the Spirit of God will move in you and you will become more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Friends, Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. Don't say all ways lead to heaven. No, not every way leads to heaven. Jesus is the only way. You cannot deny Jesus and say, I will have God or I have God. Not possible. Both go hand in hand. When you have one, then you will have the other. I will lead you now in a very short prayer. If you pray this prayer and you mean it with all your heart, today you will become born again. And your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life. And you will spend eternity in heaven instead of hell. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe he is your son. He died for my sins. You raised him up from the dead on the third day. Precious, dear Jesus, I ask you this day to come into my life. Be my Lord and my own Savior. I repent of my sins and I believe that my sins are now washed away in your own precious blood. That my name is now written in the Lamb's book of life. I am now a child of God. Father God, I give you all the glory for this in the name of Jesus. Good friends, if you prayed that prayer, congratulations. You are now a child of God and welcome into the kingdom of God. Now, there is a subsequent experience called the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Some people call it baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is an endowment of power. If you want to know more about this, you, if you go to my iCarve on YouTube, there is a teaching there titled, Speaking in Tongues is for Every Believer. It will help you, walk you through, and explain so many things for you so that you can be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. Find a good church where they teach the word of God. It's very, very imperative that you grow in your faith. And you can only grow by the word of God. By the Bible, God will put in you the desire to study the word of God. He will give you understanding and revelation to his Holy Ghost. But you've got to be the one that will make that move first. Then he will take over from there. I want to use this opportunity to thank our partners all over the world for everything you are doing to spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to continue, if you want to become a partner to this ministry, go to our website. It is KUIM.org. Friends, remember, it is only those who hear the word of God they, and they put them in practice. The doers of the word of God. They are the ones who will always get the benefits of the word of God. I pray for you this day. May God bless you and be with you. May he lift up his countenance upon you. 
and give you peace and fight your battles for you. Give you divine health. Provide for you financially. May he give you wisdom and revelation. The revelation of his word. That you may grow every day in your faith. That your work, your Christian work with him will every day be perfected by the power of his Holy Ghost. I pray that he will bless the rest of your week in the name of Jesus Christ. Everybody said, Amen. Remember, my good friends, surely there is an end. There is a day the trumpet will sound. Surely there is an end and your expectations will never be cut off. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Yatabus, kutubus, kutubes, kelebes, kentabus, si iar angrodos kubu, kashkalaparu. Then the fungrades kedu kubush kalapante, le gengrodos kubushera, arama englendem. Oh, baja kire kugrodos kubungredem, mana aska bush kentakele krete. Oh, 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 oh,